Right. Welcome back, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor David Dunmer. Uh, David uh, started uh, his uh, scientific career in Oxford, uh, where he did his uh, PhD with David Buckingham, then after several uh, postdoctoral periods in uh, the UK, and also in the US on a Fulbright uh, Fellowship, he became, well, he moved to uh, Sheffield, where he became Professor of Chemistry, and uh, ultimately also head of uh, the department. He then moved uh, on a full research position to the University of Southampton, where he retired a couple of years ago, and he's now uh, a visiting professor uh, of the University of Manchester, and also an advisor to our uh, network. And um, today he's going to uh, tell us about uh, liquid crystals, their structured fluid for applications. So. Okay. Okay, everybody hear me? Well, thank you for that introduction, uh, Dirk. It's a, a, a great pleasure to be here and to talk to you a bit about conventional liquid crystals, that is liquid crystals formed from small molecules. Uh, the, as we've seen, we've extended the scale, or we, I say we collectively, uh, experts in Oxford and other places have extended the scale at which we can see liquid crystalline behaviour from molecules uh, up to colloidal particles. So this um, presentation is really um, quite useful, I hope, in bringing things up to date for, to where we are with liquid crystals, that is organised fluids, and where uh, the colloidal systems can take over and move on to uh, many, many new applications for the benefit of all, I'm sure. Uh, the liquid crystal story is a European story, as I hope will become clear, uh, but the uh, development of liquid crystal technologies has been global, as you will be aware, and of course, we are relying in this lecture hugely on liquid crystals. If we didn't have liquid crystals, uh, this uh, presentation wouldn't have happened. So um, they're, quite, they're, they're quite valuable to us. Uh, I should also say that Eindhoven is a rather special place in the liquid crystal story, as I will uh, point out uh, uh, later on. And uh, so it's, it's appropriate to, to, uh, to be here. Uh, did, the, the first slide has popped up, never mind. Um, the, it's always difficult talking to a general audience uh, of mixed backgrounds and so on, so, uh, because some will know a great deal, some will perhaps know some, somewhat less, about the topic, and so I don't want to assume too much. So it's going to be a fairly uh, basic uh, presentation, um, but I hope there's something in it for everybody. I'm going to try to do some demonstrations. The demonstrations that you saw in the previous presentation were very high tech. These are very low tech, um, but <laughs> let's hope that they work. I should first apologize for giving this lecture in English rather than Dutch, uh, you'll probably be aware that uh, not many English people speak Dutch. Um, however, uh, I will try to avoid to, uh, to confuse you too much. We do in English have a description of the language of total confusion, and it might not surprise you that we call it double Dutch. <laughs> So, I'm not speaking in Dutch, I shall try and avoid dub, double Dutch. Actually, in England, as in many other countries, we use the term Dutch to describe lots of things, not always in a favourable way. Uh, for example, uh, if you're invited to a Dutch treat, then you end up paying for it yourself. <laughs> I do like the idea of a Dutch feast, though, which I only learnt about recently. And a Dutch feast is a party where the host gets drunk before the guests. <laughs> so, so let's move on uh, to the topic of the talk, uh, liquid crystals. 
what are liquid crystals, and uh, a slide like this, as you've already seen, um, the Greeks introduced us to the states of matter. They identified three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas, and then, well, they thought fire was also an, uh, a, a, a sort of state of matter, but uh, we can forget about that. Um, however, and that description served pretty well for many centuries, but it was not quite the whole story, and uh, we, liquid crystals, as the name implies, is the f another state of matter, the fourth state of matter, and it sits between the solid state and the liquid state, and these are accessed in terms of um, molecular systems, at least, by uh, changing the temperature, but as was explained uh, in the previous talk, uh, you can also uh, access these different phases in, in uh, colloids systems by changing the concentration. So it's, it's another way of doing it. So liquid crystals are an intermediate state between the solid and the liquid phases, and they can be accessed by melting appropriate solids and uh, at a certain temperature, they will uh, turn into uh, uh, a liquid crystal and then a liquid. And you can see some of the types of liquid crystals that exist, soaps, biomembranes, electronic materials, and structural materials. And I'll be talking about some of those. Well, to start off with, I thought I would actually try and demonstrate this uh, phase transition. Uh, with a sample that I've got, and uh, if all goes well, we can do this. I should introduce my uh, assistant, if that's the right word, Luis Cortez, who is one of the uh, die struck fellows uh, working in Oxford, and he's been bullied into uh, <laughs> sitting behind the desk there and working all the technology. So, uh, but anything that goes wrong is, of course, his responsibility, not mine. <laughs> no, I don't this mean This is a small sample of a room temperature liquid crystal. Um, some of the, those at the front will be able to see that it's a turbid material, and uh, it's rather an important material. This is the, about the amount of liquid crystal that is in your um, large screen TV. And in fact, it is the material that um, stimulated, kick-started the liquid crystal display industry. It's a, a room temperature liquid crystal which uh, it, it was very important for that development, and I'll be saying a bit more about that uh, later. Right, so let's see. Uh, I should say that at 20 degrees, this would be solid. It should be solid, but it's, except it was solid, but it supercools fairly easily. So uh, the first, the transition, the melting transition from solid to liquid crystal, I'm not going to show because it's already melted, but it is, it's a turbid liquid. Um, and I'm going to heat it, and we'll see what happens next. So if we put it in the right place there, can you... Right, there we go. And... There we are. You can see it's beginning to clear. So that that, um, I won't uh, take all the time, it's, it's clearing slowly. So the, that uh, liquid that we had, had before, or fluid I should say, that was turbid, has had another melting transition, apparently, to uh, another fluid phase, which is the ordinary liquid. 
And if we leave that in time, it'll, uh, it'll com come back to the liquid crystalline state. Right, so can you go back to the s slides and then... Next slide, then. Okay. The first experiment like that was actually done more, more than 120 years ago by a biochemist by the name of Friedrich Reinitzer. Uh, and it wasn't on that material. It was on a material that he was studying as an extract of carrots. And it was a cholesterol derivative, cholesterol benzoate, for those that uh, understand these pictures. And he found that uh, it did exactly what I had just demonstrated, that the crystal melted, in this case at 145, to uh, a turbid fluid. And then on further heating up to 178, it went clear. So there are two uh, melting points. And really, that's as far as Reinitzer uh, could go in his interpretation of uh, the situation. Um, he was chemist by training, and um, he didn't have any other techniques at his, his disposal. But he had heard of... Uh, next slide, please. Uh, he'd heard of uh, a, a man by the name of uh, Otto Lehmann, who was working in Dresden, but uh, quite soon moved to uh, Karlsruhe, who had invented a new type of microscope, a microscope that had a hot stage. You could heat it, and so you could see what happened um, to samples um, on heating, whereas previously microscopes, which have, again we've been introduced to, were, were only operated at room temperature. Now, and it was a particularly a particular special sort of microscope. It was a polarizing microscope. Now, polarizing microscopes in the 19th century were extremely important because they enabled the study of minerals. Geology and mineralogy in the 19th century was an extremely uh, vibrant topic because of mining considerations. And the polarizing microscope, which is just uh, an ordinary mi microscope, but with polars, Let's see if it works on here. Yes, I'm sure you can see. With two polarizers. And if you put them, if they're crossed, then it's black. And if they're parallel, uh, you can see through it. And the remarkable uh, property of the polarizing microscope was that it could, uh, in, under the polarizing microscope, liquids and gases, if you wanted to look at them, appeared black, and the polarizers were crossed. But if you put minerals and crystals underneath, then you could actually see them. And if you change the orientation of the crystal, then uh, you've got uh, different images. And this became extremely valuable for identifying uh, crystals and working out um, details of the, of the crystal structure. So the polarizing microscope was very important. Now, uh, Reinitzer uh, uh, sent his samples to Lehmann, and Lehmann uh, then spent uh, a, quite a long time, most of a year, studying these. And he, in it, this is one of the images that, that he saw. He saw strange um, objects. You can see some of them look rod-like um, that, uh, that they hadn't seen, seen under, uh, in previous circumstances. Uh, but these could move, they, they were flowing, and they could flow into one another, they could coalesce, um, or they could uh, separate sometimes. Um, and the, the, this was a thin film, but he also studied uh, in detail droplets, and these are some of the images of the droplets that he studied. And there are pages and pages and pages of these pictures. They're, of course, not colored photographs. These were hand-painted by either Lehman or his technician peering down the microscope. And he claimed to see all sorts of phenomena. Um, and as, as I will um, explain later on, he was quite, uh, he, he was uh, so convinced about 
uh, the uh, remarkability of these, uh, this new material that he thought he'd discovered the secret of life because the, uh, in, within the droplets you could get apparently cell division and, uh, um, uh, then, and coupling as well, uh, all sorts of phenomena. Um, but m more of that later. Next slide, please. Now, the, the news got out. They published a few papers on this, to, and others picked up the, uh, the story. And two chemists in particular uh, made uh, lots of, uh, or not a lot, but a number of other materials to study to, so that uh, there were materials around for people to, to look at. And let me mention, first of all, uh, Ludwig Gatterman, working in Freiburg, and he actually made the, the liquid crystal material, which uh, is called periazoxyanosol, or PAA, uh, which became the standard material for, for about 30 years. Um, everybody made measurements on uh, PAA. Um, but Daniel Vorlander was actually uh, much more committed to liquid crystals, and in the period of his work from the uh, 1900 to 1940s, he produced over a, a thousand uh, liquid crystal materials, which he stored in his cigar boxes. As you can see, a lot of smoking went on in the chemistry labs at that time, and, and uh, so there were plenty of empty cigar boxes. I have to say that these cigar boxes have in fact survived um, in Halle, which is where um, uh, Vorlander worked, and uh, it's still possible uh, to, to see them. Now, next slide, please. Which is a blank, I think. Oh, no, okay, before I go into that, I've got a demonstration of that. Uh, let me uh, anticipate the demonstration a bit to, to tell you what we know about the structure of liquid crystals now. And of course, um, as a result of the, uh, the work that was done in the first uh, decades of the uh, 20th century, the chemists realized that certain shapes of molecules would form liquid crystals and other shapes wouldn't. And the characteristic feature of a, of a molecular shape that caused it to form a liquid crystal was that it was elongated. Um, and um, later on, they were able to make disc-like or star-shaped uh, molecules that also form liquid crystals, but that came later. But initially, so they were all... Uh, so the liquid crystals were formed by rod-shaped molecules, extended molecules. Now, to... to uh, put you in the picture, as it were, we can now have a pretty good understanding of the basic uh, structures of uh, liquid crystals. And uh, th these are computer simulations of uh, elongated uh, particles. And the three states uh, that I'm de demonstrating here is the crystal state where the particles or molecules, if you prefer, are all organized in terms of their orientations and positions. This is, is how they would be in a crystal uh, uh, lattice. And then if you heat uh, that, then the crystal melts, and you have a complete dis disordered array of the elongated uh, molecules or rods, which is the liquid state. But in between those two states, over here, is the liquid crystal state in which the orientations of these elongated uh, species are ordered. That is, they're all pointing roughly in the same direction, but the positions are completely randomized. So that the, this inter intermediate state, which uh, characterizes uh, uh, the liquid crystalline structures, is where we have order of the orientations of molecules, but not the positions. So this is still fluid. Um, the molecules can move around, but there are, there's, there's no um, orientation, uh, translational order. In fact, in uh, other liquid crystal phases, as we'll see later, uh, there are uh, phases which have a number, a degree of translational ordering. Um, 
but they're, st they're still fluid phases and they still have orientational uh, order or, or, and translational, some translational disorder uh, and that they're still liquid crystals. Right, we've got a, I've got a movie, thanks to Lewis, uh, of the... Um, uh, now, these are rods, these are fluorescent rods and this is, the, this is what we can do today and I said with colloidal systems, instead of changing the temperature, we change the concentration. And so this is a sample of fluorescent rods of about uh, three, four microns length. They've been uh, labeled with fluorescent dye, so you can actually see them. And you can, on this uh, picture, the uh, there's a density gradient. The, the concentration is increasing as we go down. And at low concent lowish concentrations, we've got fairly random motion, which is uh, the iso equivalent to the isotropic phase, or is the isotropic phase. Then there's a phase transition here, going into the uh, liquid crystal state, and this is the liquid crystal state that we call a pneumatic state. And then uh, further down, we have uh, something that is much more solid-like, um, and it. It may be um, a, uh, a solid or a glass, or um, it may be one of these uh, liquid crystal states, a smectic state, which has got some degree of translational order. And sometimes you can see layers forming, which is characteristic of that. OK, th uh, thanks for that. Uh, the, the, this uh, orientational organization and uh, translational disorder occurs in lots of things. I rather like this picture. This is a uh, liquid crystalline state of sheep, um, and uh, you can see the positions are, ra are randomized, but the orientations are all um, uh, organized. Um, and for the uh, experts in the audience who like to study defects, we've even got our own defect there. So. <laughs> Uh, ne next slide, which I think is a blank slide. Right, now to another demonstration. I said that uh, the German chemists of old kept their uh, liquid crystals in cigar boxes. Well, I've got a cigar box here, and it's, uh, it's got some liquid crystal particles in it. Um, you can probably see them. They're, they're all um, they're nicely aligned, um, and uh, apparently... In, in a layer, but actually that's because they're in a box. Um, and uh, what is interesting, uh, they're not, that is to say they're organized in two dimensions, not three dimensions. And they're rather special particles as well. Let me take one out. Can you put that on the table? They're chiral particles. And that is, uh, they are left-handed or right-handed, depending on how you want to define them. Uh, and you will all know about chirality or handedness. Uh, most people are achiral. That is, they have a plane of, mirror plane of symmetry that goes down uh, the centre of them, uh, assuming, hopefully, that they've still got all their limbs. Um, and it's uh, rumoured that uh, the perceived beauty of a person depends on the extent to which the left-hand side of the face matches the right-hand side of the face. So it occurred to me that when you're next uh, posting an image on a dating site, I suggest that you take a picture, you Photoshop it, and flip one side, and put it on, and see if, the, see if your chances are better. <laughs> I haven't tried it. <laughs> Okay, so we've got these chiral particles, and what we really want to know is how they organise themselves in three dimensions. Well, um, this is a sort of a way of trying to demonstrate that. It's a bit artificial, but never mind. Um, and I'm just, um, just stacking them up and in a fairly random fashion uh, to see what happens. Whoops say random, it's almost random. I don't, want to put, I don't want to build any defects into it if I can avoid doing that. That's, um, OK, so there we are. They're, they're sort of randomly arranged. The orientations are randomly arranged 
in three dimensions. But now if we want them to be liquid crystalline, now liquid crystalline order means that we want the directions to be as parallel as possible. So let's try and line them up and uh, hopefully it'll work. Let's see, see what happens. Yes, you can probably come and assist too. I, I can, yeah, okay. So we're making them as parallel as possible. We're not forcing them, we're just spinning them around to find, let them find their, their most comfortable position. I think that may be a defect, is it? <laughs> uh, well, we're almost there. Um, I think you can see what's happening. We're getting a helix formed. And I probably don't need to go right to the top, but uh, I think that, that'll do. I think you see the idea. Um, so these chiral rods have stacked up in a helical arrangement. And these helical arrangements, so can we go back to the slides, uh, have a rather special property. Um, there, there's the stack of uh, twisted uh, he, 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 rods. Um, forming a three-dimensional helix. And uh, this is, it's still a pneumatic liquid crystal, but it's a chiral pneumatic liquid crystal. And in fact, the first material that uh, uh, um, Reinitzer studied was cholesterol benzoate, which in fact is, is itself a chiral material. Um, and this phase, this um, handed pneumatic liquid crystal, is actually called, or was called for a long time, a cholesteric liquid crystal because it was shown by um, derivatives of cholesterol. Now, if you align these um, helices, which is quite easy to do, all you need to do is to make sure that the bottom uh, molecules are aligned in a particular uniform direction. Um, you make a thin film of this, and then you look at it under various optical conditions. You find that it reflects uh, light in a particular way, and in fact the only light that is uh, reflected back is actually polarised light, but it's not linearly polarised light, it's circularly polarised light. And I won't go into, if, if, if you don't, uh, not familiar with that, well, you'll have to take my word for the fact that light is a wave motion, it can go up and down, or side to side, or it can also... Uh, execute a sort of uh, a circular motion going through space, and that's circular polarisation. Now, this, uh, these, this uh, particular material of uh, cholesteric liquid crystal in a film selectively reflects circularly polarised light at the same uh, wavelength, the same colour, uh, corresponding to the pitch of the helix. Now, the interesting thing is that you can change the pitch of uh, these uh, films um, by changing their temperature um, or, cha or you can apply fields, you can apply pressure, do all sorts of things. So you can change the apparent colour of the uh, film by changing these external variables. So this becomes a sensor. In fact, this was the first application of uh, liquid crystals that was found and the pitch uh, varies with um, Temperature and hence the uh, colour uh, ch changing the temperature. So, have the next. And so, this is the origin of the um, liquid crystal thermometers, which you uh, may well have seen in different circumstances. This is a thermometer for parties, it's got a, 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 a wine region and a lager region. This is a more se serious application. And I'm going to pass this round. This is um, it's, it's a rather nice, it's a very simple example, a nice example. It's a room temperature thermometer. You can play with it yourself. The only downside of these liquid crystal thermometers is that um, uh, uh, the uh, blue is hot and red is cold. That is because uh, the, usually the pitch of the helix gets um, sh uh, shorter as you... Um, as you cool it down, and uh, no, the other way around, is that right? Yeah, the other way around. Um, so it's, um, that, that's, but 
but you can get materials that work the other way. So I can pass that round and you can... Now, the way it works, actually, there are stripes there, and each stripe corresponds to a different mixture of liquid crystal material, so that the range of temperatures over which it changes colour is different for each band, and so that's how it works as a thermometer. Okay. Um, let's, yeah, thanks. Right. I said that there are a variety of liquid crystal phases, and some of them, uh, and the one I've been talking about has been the pneumatic phase, in which there's orientational order but no positional order um, in th three dimensions, um, and the chiral version of that is the colosteric phase. But there are uh, many, many phases now uh, of uh, liquid crystal phases, more than 20, and the smectic phases are liquid crystal phases in which the molecules, or indeed the rods, are uh, orientationally ordered. They may be ordered perpendicular to the layers or at an angle to the layers. Um, but there, is, there are layers, so that is, there is, there is some uh, translational organisation. That means that you can detect these in x-rays very easily, and you get proper Bragg reflections, but only from uh, the scattering due to the layers. That is, uh, they are liquid in the, in the plane of the layers, but solid-like perpendicular to the layers. They are one-dimensional solids, if you like two-dimensional liquids. And indeed, there are uh, other uh, another class of liquid crystal known as columna, in which uh, you have uh, solid-like, that is a lattice organization of positions in two dimensions, but along the columns, they're liquid-like. So you have a one-dimensional fluid liquid along the column and a two-dimensional two solid perpendicular to the columns. So there's a, and, and lots and lots of variants of those. And I should say that I, the pictures I put up there are just obviously models, um, and this could, uh, these models could apply equally to molecules or to uh, rods. So it's relevant for the work of this uh, network in terms of colloidal systems. So, next. Right. Now, how do we can, how can we identify these different phases? And we use the polarizing microscope. Um, and the wonderful thing about the, trans, the liquid crystals under the polarizing microscope is that they are solid like you get colored images resulting from the fact that the molecules have some uh, or orientational organization. And this orientational organization <coughs> means that the optical properties vary in uh, different directions. And the fact that the optical properties of refractive indices are different in different directions means that you get interference effects, and this shows up as colours, and uh, the uh, arrangement of the, the colours uh, with uh, experience, you begin to be able to uh, detect um, different phases on the basis of what they look like under the polarizing microscope. So it's a very valuable uh, tool for uh, liquid crystal scientists. Right, there, so here's just some examples. They're, they're very pretty. That's why I like looking at them. This one is, I'm very fond of. Uh, this is of the pneumatic phase. You can see it's pretty, it looks sort of fluid, but the interesting thing for me is that these lines are rather special uh, lines. They're actually fluid defects, and you can see these very clearly in, in the microscope. Um, so uh, the liquid crystal phase has uh, some, something in common with crystalline states in that it forms defects, uh, whereas a, a pure liquid, there are no de uh, defects in it. This is a smectic phase, a layered phase. You can see it looks a bit more rigid. It still flows, um, but it, it, it's, it's more solid-like. Uh, this, again, is a picture I'm particularly fond of. This is, actually shows a range of textures of a chiral uh, liquid crystal, a chiral pneumatic phase, and um, it's actually, there's a concentration gradient across this as it happens, and you get these wonderful images. Uh, this uh, picture here was provided by Dirk for me, and it shows a columnar phase, um, and uh, th this is, a, this is a, 
characteristic of columnar phase. It doesn't have quite the, uh, the, the aesthetic beauty, I don't think, of these, of these phases, but um, it has some qualities, and uh, uh, the suggestion was that uh, maybe um, uh, Vincent van Gogh was uh, uh, drawing his inspiration from what he might have imagined uh, columnar phases to look like. Who knows? Okay, thanks. In the late 1970s, uh, uh, actually it was in about 1980, I was um, hired by a large American corporation to look into the prior art, so-called, of liquid crystal displays. And the reason for that was that, um, as I'll explain later, um, that they were going to challenge patents that had been filed to, for uh, the new generation of liquid crystal displays. It was as a result of that um, particular task that I came across uh, the, this gentleman, uh, Esvalod uh, Fredericks, a Russian, and his papers. And he had uh, got interested in liquid crystals in the 1920s and was working away um, to find out a little bit more about the physics and optics of uh, liquid crystals. He, he um, and the, the important um, thing that he discovered was that you could change the orientation of a liquid crystal by applying either an electric field or a magnetic field. And uh, the, as a consequence of changing the orientation, then uh, the optical properties of the film of liquid crystal changed. In fact, what you could do with, if you have polarizers top and bottom, you can, you can create an optical switch, which switches from being black to white or white to black. Now, an optical switch is the um, fundamental um, aspect of any system of electronic system of display or communication. And so uh, this potentially, or had a lot of potential, as we'll see uh, uh, later. This is a threshold effect. That is, you apply a voltage and nothing happens until it reaches a certain value and then uh, the change occurs. And um, in fact, uh, the, the switch back is driven as well, not by a, a field, but there are elastic uh, torques on the, mo on the molecules or rods, as I represent them here, from the treatment on the surfaces. So uh, this is the Frederick's effect. And he actually initially discovered the effect um, using uh, magnetic fields. And I, the, the next slide, I think, is the demonstration that uh, we're going to try and show you. And this is, we take a film of liquid crystal. And it's going to be between polarizers. And the liquid the crystal is aligned so that it's perpendicular to the film surfaces. And we're going to apply a magnetic field to this film. And what it's going to do is to change the orientation of the molecules in this film. And as a result, the, uh, it'll change the refractive indices in particular directions. And you'll get interference patterns that might not look as uh, pretty as that. But uh, what, you're, what these interference patterns are mapping out is the uh, orientation of the liquid crystal within the film. Now, the demonstration that I've set up here is actually um, going to be a rather slow in, in time scale. But in fact, if you do things right and you have thin uh, films, you can switch on the uh, millisecond time scale. So these are fast optical switches. And so let's. Um, do that now. So we've got two polarizers. Um, put the sample on. <coughs> oh, we haven't got the camera there. Okay, do you want to put the camera on? Right, okay, there we are. That's not bad. Right, so that is a, this, the, um, 
sample, and in fact, um, it's, uh, it should be perfectly black, but it's not quite, probably the, there's a slight variation in thickness, and uh, maybe the light is not totally collimated. Now, we can see what happens uh, applying magnetic field. You need rather strong magnetic fields, so I've got the, um, some of these rare earth magnets, and let's uh, see if I can demonstrate the switching effect with a magnetic field. There we are. So the rings that you see are a direct consequence of the alignment of the liquid crystal molecules in the thin film switching in the <coughs> magnetic field. And the, the more rings you see, the greater the deformation. Uh, there are, and so this is the basis of switching in uh, liquid crystal TVs. Um, you're doing it with electric fields, not magnetic fields, um, but uh, the principle is the same. So that's, I've put the, I've um, turned the magnetic round. It's looking, it's a transverse field now, but uh, you see beautiful pictures. Okay, that's good. Let's uh, get back to the slides. Okay, next slide. No, okay, it's a bit slow. Right, and I want to tell you a little bit about Fredericks because he's a great character. He came from a noble family in Russia. He had, his father and grandfather were um, governors of eastern provinces in Russia, um, working for the Tsar. He didn't uh, follow the career path of his uh, father or grandfather, he, uh, uh, Vesvalod wanted to be a scientist and he studied in Switzerland and in Germany. But in the, uh, and he escaped the uh, troubles of, of the Russian Revolution in 1917, which killed his father. Uh, but he went back to uh, Petrograd uh, or Leningrad and uh, studied there uh, and was doing research in the Op State Optical Institute um, until around about 19, I think it was 1934, when uh, you will know the story of Stalin's paranoia and the, the battles that were going on within the uh, hierarchy in, in the administration. And uh, there was a, a, a coup against Stalin in Leningrad uh, nothing, uh, and as, as a result of that, uh, um, the local Communist Party secretary was killed, um, and this was an excuse to round up all of the intellectuals um, in uh, Leningrad. A hundred thousand were rounded up and disposed of one way or another. Sadly, Fredericks was uh, amongst these, um, and he was uh, eventually put on trial. Uh, these were the, um, uh, this is a transcript of his trial, uh, and uh, well, you can read it as, as, as well as I can. Uh, what, were you going to commit any acts? Well, they, uh, what specific actions did your organization carry out? Uh, and I personally don't know any. any. Well, what, the transcript of the trial, trial was not really relevant. He was guilty as he walked into the room, and he was sentenced to 10 years in a labor camp. Um, he was already 50 when he, he, this happened, and uh, sadly he didn't last. Um, he died in the gulag. But he was no ordinary prisoner. He was an academic. He was well connected with uh, many in the Russian establishment. And in particular, he was a brother-in-law of Shost the composer Shostakovich. And Shostakovich was thought to be close to Stalin um, in, uh, by some. I think that, that our view of that is now is changing, but um, uh, even uh, the intervention of Shostakovich and other senior academicians in the Russian Academy of Science is, uh, couldn't save him. And uh, so uh, he, he perished in the gulag. However, a, a physicist that was in, imprisoned with him said that uh, Frederick still went on working, and in fact he worked out the elastic uh, uh, theory of uh, liquid crystals to explain his, uh, uh, his effect, the switching that I've just shown you. So um, 
the, the, the story is, this, it's a very sad story because there's no, although we've got letters exchanged between Fredericks and his family, his wife was also sent off to um, um, exile somewhere else. His son was looked after by his, his grandparents in Moscow. Um, and as far as we can tell, he never saw, after being sent off to the Gulag, he never saw his family again. Uh, a sad story. Um, of course, when the regime changed under Khrushchev in the 56, um, Fredericks was rehabilitated a bit late, uh, uh, sadly, um, but he's remembered <coughs> through uh, the, the Fredericks Medal, which was introduced by the Russian Liquid Crystal Society in 1997, but also he's, he's remembered through every electronic device that we use today using liquid crystals, which um, use the Fredericks effect. Next slide, please. But the first liquid crystal display didn't use the Fredericks effect. Um, actually, the, the RCA was a big industry making displays, conventional displays, cathode ray tubes, and um, but they were investigating other uh, possible display technologies. In the period after the, the, um, the Second World War, uh, the physicists turned their attention from uh, war-like uh, matters to applying them for peaceful purposes. And there was a huge development in all sorts of technologies. The microwave oven was uh, invented and uh, lasers were discovered and all, all sorts of other, other things. And there was a, it was decided that we should look at other possible ways of displaying in, information, that is the man-machine interface, uh, and which didn't require large vacuum tubes, as in cathode ray tubes. Well, uh, to, to cut a long story a, a, a short, um, RCA uh, came up with uh, an invention. It d depends on a, a phenomenon known as dynamic scattering. It uses rather unstable materials. And in fact, for it to work, they actually have to be impure um, because it's, uh, it, it, it relies on ionic um, circulation in, uh, in the, the films. And eventually, the, the displays uh, die. Um, it was announced with uh, great acclaim this will have a major effect on the electronics industry. In fact, it didn't. And in 1972, RCA stopped all of their liquid crystal activity. Um, next slide, please. One of the people working in RCA was um, Wolfgang Helfrich, which might be known to some of you in the audience. And he, while working in the liquid crystal group in RCA, had come up with a, an alternative idea about a display uh, that might work, based on Fredericks, actually, but not uh, of Fredericks uh, original configuration, which, if you remember, had these two surfaces parallel to one another, but uh, a configuration in which one surface was twisted through 90 degrees with respect to the other. The switching effect was essentially the same from uh, a, a uh, transverse alignment to a perpendicular alignment. And it worked in exactly the same way. Uh, it provided an optical switch between polarizers. Well, um, because the liquid crystal group was going to close down, uh, Wolfgang Helfrich um, had to find another job. And he did find another job with the uh, Swiss company Hoffman La Roche. He actually, I should say that he presented his idea to the guy on the previous slide, Halmeyer, um, who said, no, that'll never work. Um, my, my display is much better. My display is going to make billions for RCA. But as, as I say, it didn't happen. So Helfrich went away, uh, left the company with this idea in the, his head. And he met up with Martin Schatt, who was uh, another physicist at the time who'd been working in uh, Ottawa in Canada. And uh, they both uh, joined this um, uh, com Swiss company, Hoffman La Roche, which had been previously largely pharmaceutical and cosmetic company. 
Within a matter of months between them, they had made uh, the first twisted pneumatic display, which you see there, and, uh, the, um, and, and it was patented, and then a huge, uh, well, as I say, the, the patent battles began, of which I was involved, whether this was new or not, um, eventually decided that it was new enough, so lots of people made lots of money, or rather lots of companies made lots of money. The lawyers, I suspect, made most of the money. Um, but uh, uh, and this was the, marked the beginning of the display industry. On the next slide, please. Right, there were still problems, which was that uh, the materials that were being used in the first display of uh, Shatton Helfrich were not that good. In fact, initially, they weren't even liquid crystalline at room temperature, so the whole display had to be heated up in order to, for it to work. But a breakthrough came with the, the, uh, the United Kingdom chemist George Gray working at, at Hull, but he was actually working under contract with the Ministry of Defence, and he discovered this material, uh, pentar, uh, and sorry, this one, pent, pentyl cyanobiphenyl, and this is actually what you know, I showed you the... Um, demonstration with, this is a sample of this material, which was liquid crystalline at room temperature, very stable, didn't uh, deteriorate in, under conditions of electric fields or light or anything. Um, I picked up this, it was quite a, uh, a nice cartoon. This was published in the, the Swiss Watch Journal. They weren't terribly um, keen on the idea of liquid crystal technology, and so they, uh, this is a cartoon indi indicating their um, uh, lack of um, enthusiasm about the, the new invention. However, I should say, I do think the last laugh is with them, because they can charge $50,000 for a watch, and uh, we can only get a, a, few, uh, a few euros for a, a watch display. So uh, it didn't actually change much. Right, next slide, please. Um, OK, so um, the, the rest, as, as, as I say, is history, at least in the display business. Um, the first uh, uh, liquid crystal TV was uh, produced in 1983 by Seiko. That's five centimetre diameter there. And then it went on to produce these very uh, big, fancy, high-definition screens. And here's a, a mock-up of a, a 3D uh, glasses-free laptop, which I've actually seen and, and, and had to, uh, available to demonstrate. It doesn't look quite as dramatic as that, uh, but uh, it, the, the, the liquid crystal technology will, will go on. And I should say that the modern um, displays use the effect that I showed you initially of the Frederick's effect. They no longer use twisted um, pneumatic d d configuration. They use uh, something called vertical alignment, which is where, where the liquid crystal film is, as I showed you, initially vertical, and then it switches to horizontal and then switches back. And that's, so that is the Frederick's effect, and that's what is in all of the um, displays that you see today. Right, um, next slide, please. Now, this is going to have to be quick, because I've only got four minutes. Um, uh, Going back to Lehman, uh, liquid crystals and, and life. Uh, Lehman was, uh, became obsessed by uh, the idea that liquid crystals were the answer to the secret of life. And uh, this was partly inspired by this observation. That in the mid-19th century, Rodolf Virchow had uh, been studying, using conventional micro microscope, various biological samples. And here is, is an image that he drew, or his technician drew, of human nerve fibres underwater. And uh, so this was available in the literature. Uh, Lehmann was studying various uh, mixtures of things to, in the context of liquid crystals to see what he could do. And by uh, mixing uh, a soap, which would be a, a salt of uh, oleic acid and water, and, and, uh, or rather looking at the contact region between water and oleic acid and, and uh, soap, uh, he found these fibres growing, and he made this connection. And what's more, he had determined that both 
these fibers were liquid crystalline because they had uh, fluid-like characteristics, but he could see them in the polarizing microscope. They had all the optical properties of the liquid crystal, exactly as did the fibers that he'd grown in this water soap system. And so he was um, quite, um, uh, I won't say convinced, but he was very enthusiastic that he, he had discovered the secret of life. And this is uh, Ernst Haeckel, um, who made this um, remark uh, that uh, the uh, discovery of Lehmann uh, was the, uh, the ultimate on the understanding living systems. Uh, okay, come on, next slide. Right. Um, the importance of liquid crystals in living systems. And that's, uh, this is going to be very brief. I should go very quick. But I will, hopefully I can sh show, show you this. Uh, this is a particular sort of beetle. And I mentioned the reflection properties of cholesteric liquid crystals. Now this, uh, these beetles, scarab beetles, reflect light um, Circularly polarized light, just like cholesteric liquid crystals. And in fact, if you analyze the properties of the reflected light, uh, they look exactly as the models uh, are, have been calculated for reflection of light from cholesteric liquid crystal phases. The, the, the shell of the, of the beetle, uh, the carapace, is not liquid crystalline, but the suggestion is that at some stage in its development, it went through a liquid crystalline state. The other point that I want to make, which um, connects with what has been said by Dirk and, and Roel, was, is the scale, uh, the scale of the structures. The scale of the structures in biosystems are in the, the, the sort of 10, well, 10 micron, in the micron, in, in the, uh, the tens of nanometers to micron scale. So it's not unreasonable that um, uh, liquid crystal uh, structures should be uh, important in biosystems. So let's two, two minutes more. Is that okay? <laughs> okay. Wrong way. <laughs> Right. Biomolecules such as proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, and so on, all form liquid crystalline phases in water. And the first um, observation of this was by J.D. Banal. Here he is with his research student, Dorothy Hodgkin. And they were investigating tobacco mosaic virus. Uh, which are rod-like particles. And rumour has it that uh, they've put, put a, a solution of this in their goldfish bowl, and they looked at the uh, gold, goldfish bowl uh, between cross polars, and they saw images that were characteristic of a liquid crystal phase. Uh, they interpreted this and did X-ray measurements, and they indeed found that there was orientational organisation of TMV particles, um, as in a liquid crystalline state. Now, um, I don't think uh, Pavlik is in the audience this morning, but um, he reproduced this experiment, and uh, here it is. This is, it's not actually TMV, this is FT virus solution between cross polars, and he's about to put a goldfish in. Now, you see the optical pattern there, these interference images, which is characteristic of uh, a pneumatic liquid crystal phase. And so um, there we are. The poor goldfish was uh, exposed to liquid crystal. I'm, uh, no goldfish were harmed in the production of this movie, I'm told. <laughs> so, OK. And the, um, so the, the liquid crystal particles are important in lots of different aspects. Um, of uh, living systems. In particular, they form the uh, membranes of, of uh, cells and, whoops, can you go back? Um, and uh, the, this uh, 
quote I put up there from a um, philosopher, at the, or uh, not a philosopher, a bi um, biochemist from uh, the 19th century, um, that all of life originates from cells and vesicles. This is a part of the cell wall containing lots of proteins, um, and vesicles are basically cells, but without the proteins. They're sort of empty uh, uh, cases. But the important thing is that it's the, the lipids which are forming a, a smectic-like bilayer uh, in the walls, and uh, so the liquid crystals are important in life. So that, uh, and, well, I'm running out of time. Just let's just quickly go through. Liquid crystals um, are also formed by uh, things such as spiders or silkworms, and they are um, uh, producing main chain polymers that are aligned in a liquid crystal state, and they are extremely strong. The, the um, okay, um, the uh, the first example of this was Kevlar. It's an aramid fibre uh, discovered by uh, Stephanie. Uh, Colec in, um, in DuPont, and this produces extremely tough materials, which you're going to see in a moment. Okay. Um, bridges, bulletproof vests, here's a bullet being stopped, um, and I think, can you go to the end now? Um, okay, skip that. Yeah, I should, no, just go back one slide. I should say, say this, that... Um, Theory has always neglected, in, or is often neglected in some of these um, scientific developments because the um, public appreciation of a TV screen or a new drug or something is vastly outweighs uh, the, all of the hard theoretical work that has driven, the, driven this discovery. Uh, so it was quite good to, to, to know that, or to, to see that uh, De Gennes was actually given the Nobel Prize in 1991 for his work on developing theories of soft matter, in particular liquid crystals. Lehmann had been proposed for the Nobel Prize on a number of occasions and failed to get it. Of course, there are lots of, uh, uh, of contributions to liquid crystal science from um, Dutch people. And I mention um, uh, Ornstein, who worked up the road in, in Utrecht, who was sadly, like Frederick, was another victim of the uh, trauma of the Second World War. He was uh, displaced from his position in the university and he died shortly afterwards. But he made very, very valuable contributions to the uh, theory of liquid crystals. And then finally, coming back to Eindhoven and uh, Philips. Um, uh, Philips was a big uh, company in the business of liquid crystal displays. Um, but sadly, in 1999, I think they sold their, or they merged with a Korean company and was finally sold off in 2003. So, but I'm very pleased to be st that staying in the hotel that is inside the, the old Phillips building. And uh, so there, there we are. We have to, I, sorry to have gone on uh, longer than I should, but uh, and here's some thanks to the Dystruck people, uh, Merck, who provided some of the materials, Sharp in Oxford and uh, in Manchester. So, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. I should also point out that David wrote a very successful uh, popular scientific book about the history of liquid crystals, and it's available in English or Japanese. Not <laughs> much. <laughs> 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 um, there's a little time for questions, if there are any burning questions. Well, I'm around. Not at the moment. I'm but around. Yeah. David's around. We can have a look at the Beatles later. Yes. Now I'm also, uh, sorry. Uh, time to uh, uh, thank our two speakers again.